Alrighty, Shabbat Shalom. And today I have a very pertinent message for the body of Messiah called, Are You a Faithful Steward? Are you a faithful steward? And a steward is an overseer, right? Over in at the household of Yahweh. A steward is an overseer over the household of Yahweh. And I think also we'll see by some of the things we're going to read today, why some don't see the times that we're living in. Because we're going to see some of the things we need to do to be able to have our eyes open to that. And I want to start in Luke 12, verse 35. Luke 12 and verse 35. And maybe I'll even start verse 32. Stop being afraid, little flock, because your father was pleased to give you the kingdom. Wow, what a scripture. We could have a whole sermon just on that one, right? Sell your possessions and give alms, and make for yourself purses that do not grow old, and unfailing treasure in heaven, where a thief cannot come near, nor moth can corrupt. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let your loins be girded about and the lamps burning, and you be like men awaiting their master when he returns from the wedding ceremony, so that he coming and knocking, they will at once open to him. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find when he comes to be awake. Right? So that's the point, meaning a lot of people aren't going to be awake, but blessed are the ones that are awake. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself and make them recline, and coming up he will serve them, just like we saw what he did at the last Passover, right? We're washing the feet of the disciples. And if he comes in the second watch, or he comes in the third watch, and finds it so, blessed are those slaves. So it's not people that are just waiting to the last moment and trying to jump on the train, but these are people that are continuously watching and praying, always understanding the times we're living in and being a good steward. But know this, that if the housemaster had known the hour the thief was coming, he would have watched and would have allowed his house, not allowed his house to be dug through. And you then, be ready, be ready, for in the moment that you don't expect it, the Son of Man comes. And that scripture is always weighed on my mind, because for people that say, oh no, we're not in the end yet, or no, we're, we still have a lot of time to go, or no, this, do they look at the scripture and think, well, at a time they think not, <laughs> the Son of Man comes, right? And you then be ready, for in that moment you don't expect it, the Son of Man comes, that moment, right? And Peter said to the master, Do you speak this parable to us or also to all? And the master said, Who then is the faithful and wise steward? Right? Are you a faithful steward? Who then is the faithful and wise steward? Now he's going to tell who it is because all of us want to be wise stewards, right? All of us have been placed uh, as a steward in, in the body of Messiah for the kingdom of Yahweh. Now he's saying, Who then is the wise and faithful steward whom the master will set over his house? Servants to give portion of food in season. So who is this? Blessed is that slave when his master comes and he will find him doing. It's the ones that are doing, not the ones that are not doing. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that slave should stay in his heart, my master delays to come and should begin to beat the men servants and the female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that slave will come in a day that he does not expect it, just like he said, and in an hour which he does not know. And he will divide him and will put his portion with the unfaithful. So very clearly, uh, the people that aren't seeing that we're in the end times are the people that aren't being faithful stewards. Because they're not watching over, always being ready, right? So... My question as we start the message today is, are you about the work of Yahweh or your own works? That's really what it comes down to. Because you can't serve two masters, we're going to read the scripture today. Are you about the work of Yahweh or your own work? Are you a faithful steward or an unfaithful steward? The work we are doing now, right, Yahweh's end time work to the nations, is the most important work on all the earth. Because everything else on this earth, and some is more important than other, but everything else is temporal. But the work, Yahweh's end time work of redeeming uh, the children of this earth back to him, it's, it's eternal ramifications of this. So the work we're doing now, Yahweh's end time work of the nation, is the most important work in all the earth. Right now, the most important decisions that governments around the world are making is whether to quarantine societies, right? 
and to save life, uh, or to open up economies before they collapse. So these are the decisions that governments are making, right? They are important decisions because people's lives and livelihoods depend on it. But if we fail at our job to redeem mankind back to Yahweh, you will have more deaths in this world than any plague could ever bring. Our responsibility before Yahweh is so great that we have a greater accountability to him to finish his work that he gave us. As this is the major reason he called me and you in these end times. So again, remember, I've said this before, I said it a couple messages ago, you are one out of 10 million people. And it wasn't random, it wasn't just by chance. Yahweh called you for a specific purpose and he called you for a specific job and this is the major, major reason he called us in the end time. So again, I'll ask several times during this message, are you a faithful steward? Are you being a faithful steward to what Yahweh called you for? Continue in verse 47 and 48. But that slave, knowing the will of his master and not preparing nor doing according to his will, will be beaten with many stripes. But he who does not know and does the thing that is worthy of stripes will be beaten with few stripes. For anyone who is given much to him much is required from him. And to whom they have committed much to him, much more they require by his hand. So it's very simple. Yes, everybody on earth is accountable for what they do, and we do reap what we sow, but our accountability is so high, much higher than the world, because our mind is open to the truth. To much is given, much is expected. So they don't know any better, and Yahweh can have mercy on their, their unbelief. But for us who know better, and have been called and trained for a specific purpose. And that's why I say the Bible school that we've done for so many years in Israel, how important that school is. Because worldly school, not to say it's not important at all, and will help you in a job and whatever, and even in this life to a degree. But the training for the kingdom of Yahweh is the thing that is going to reap eternal benefits from that. So let's go to Genesis 2 and verse 15. Genesis 2 and verse 15. It says, And Yahweh Elohim took the man and put him into the garden to work it and to keep it. And I've said this before in the purpose of man, right? Uh, when the Bible starts, we have basically one whole chapter to Genesis creation. And wow, you could write a whole book on the creation, right? And one chapter to everything which tells you that every single word in Genesis is extremely important when you're looking at creation. You could probably have volumes of books. You probably have encyclopedias, you know, of books to everything of Genesis. But, uh, so Yahweh is not worried about building a physical garden. That's not what it's about. He's using the analogy of a garden to calling people to the kingdom of Yahweh. We know this as the second Adam when he comes, Almost all of Yeshua's parables, not all of them, but many of them, way more than half of them, are about gardening and about bearing fruits and those kind of things. Because, again, he's using that analogy of us bearing fruit, like he said to uh, the apostles and to Peter, who were fishermen, for now on you will be fishers of men, right? So they're not, only, they're not going to be going out and catching fish, they're going to be catching men. So the kingdom is compared to a garden, and we are keepers to plant seeds and to bear fruit. Now, if you go to Mark 4, Mark 4, that's the parable of the sower and the seed, right? I'm not going to read the whole thing. We've done it before. I've done all messages on it called the sower and the seed. But I just want to go to the beginning of where Yeshua is explaining the parable because it's extremely important to understand this, as I just said, with the analogy has been since the Garden of Eden. So Mark 4 and verse 13 says, And he, Yeshua, said to them, Do you not know this parable? And how will you know all parables, right? So this is like the foundation of all parables. Why? Because, like I said, most parables are dealing with uh, gardening and sowing and, and reaping and planting grain, dealing with our work, our kingdom work. So these people, many of them, were farmers and uh, they can understand these type of analogies, right? So the parable of the sower and the seed, right? He's talking about some seed is falling on the roadside. 
uh, where you know it has no root whatsoever, and these are people that hear, and then the devil takes it right away from them. Some is falling on stony ground, and they don't have depth, and then when problems come up right away, you know they fall away. Some is in thorns and thistles. The majority of the people in this time are in that, the Laodicean, and in the thorns and thistles, right? Which means that it's taking a lot of the nutrients of, of, of that grain and it can't grow correctly because of the thorns and thistles and some is in good land. But the key is the next verse, right? So he says to him, if you don't know this parable, you don't know, how will you know any parable? In verse 14 says, the sower sows the word. The sower sows the word. So the seed is the word of Yahweh. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about physical seed of barley or wheat or whatever else. He's talking about the sower sows the word, that that's what we're sowing. So the seed is the word of Yahweh. The seed is the word of Yahweh. In Genesis 3, verse 17, right, what was man's failure or Adam's failure, which would be man's failure because uh, he didn't fulfill his commission of bringing the seed, of bringing the word of Yahweh to the rest of mankind. And he... Elohim said to the man, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat, the ground will be cursed because of you. You shall eat of it in sorrow all the days of your life, and it shall bring forth thorns and thistles, like we just talked about. And you shall eat the plant of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground, for you have been taken out of it. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Wow. So this is the curse that comes on mankind. So now, because of... Adam, the first man's failure, we had to wait for the second Adam. So this curse meant that up until the time of the second Adam, right, uh, mankind's work of sowing seed for the kingdom of Yahweh would be inhibited. It would be almost, you know, limited to almost nothing. And it really was when you think about it. Because except for a few people in the first covenant, uh, nobody uh, had the Holy Spirit or, re or uh, received eternal life from the first covenant that went on there, right? So due to the failure of Adam, the work of man would be by thorns and thistles. It would not be easy at that point. Uh, let's go back to Mark 8. I mean, I'm sorry, Mark 4. Let's go back now to the parable and verse 18 and 19. And he says, And those which were sown into a thorny place, or they who hear the word, and the cares of the world and the deception of riches and the rest of the other lusts enter in and choke the word and it becomes without fruit, right? Well, so this is what we're talking about. This is the biggest problem today. Uh, we live in such a crazy, unnatural world. And uh, like I said, for almost 6,000 years, like 5,900 years, uh, the exchange of money was pretty even. You know, you go back to... 1920 and 1930, you could still buy a penny's worth of candy and almost get a bag for it for one penny. And here it is just a hundred years later. And wow, you look at things. You look at, you know, what it costs for, uh, to get whatever, to get a, a gallon of milk now is five dollars, uh, just about something like that, right? So it's unnatural. It's unnatural. And it's the same way here, that the cares of the world, the deception of riches and the rest of and other lusts enter in and choke the word that becomes unfruitful. So we must realize the impact of this scripture today in commercial Babylon. It's that simple. Uh, global trading, millions of people traveling every day on airplanes and trains, you know, not as much now with COVID, but right up to COVID and even so, uh, still a lot. The, like I said, the prices of food, shelter are astronomical compared to what they were for first 1,500 years since the Garden of Eden. We live in a false satanic system of commercial Babylon, but to be a faithful steward, you still must eat, breathe, and you have to live in a mentality of the kingdom of Yahweh. So it's very hard on us. I said that before in messages that here it is. We are, we are physical people. We're in a physical body, but we're trying to live in a spiritual realm. We're physical people. We live in a physical body, but we're trying to... to to be in a spiritual realm, you know? So, uh, you have to deny the flesh to do that. And in the world we're living in, like I said, that is so unnatural, so unnatural. 
in commercial Babylon, it's very difficult to do this. But to be a faithful steward, you have to live in that mentality every day of your life. You have to, and that's the reason why we have to wake up every day and we have to be studying our Bible the first thing we're doing. And it's not just reading. It's not, it's not a chore. It's not you get up and I'm going to read three chapters or I'm going to read five chapters or some people one chapter. Like it's some kind of chore. It's not a chore. It is, like Yeshua said, my food is to, to do the will of the Father and finish his work. Right? We're going to read that in a little bit here. And that should be our food. Our food when we get up and you're first getting up in the morning. You're, you should be yearning for spiritual food before you're yearning for physical food. And like I said, you should be joyful, you should be happy, it should be the greatest joy in your life that you have a Bible in front of you, and that you can open it and read it. It shouldn't be a chore that's there. Because that is the only thing, living in a mentality of the kingdom of Yahweh is the only thing that's going to keep you as a faithful steward. Because if not, you know what? And this is what we're going to see here. It's between being a steward of the world and caring for the things of the world, or a steward of Yahweh and caring for his things. But you can't do both. You can't do both. You know, or you either love the one and hate the other, or despise the one and cleave to the other, right? You can't serve Yahweh and Mammon. It's that simple. So, uh, Matthew 6, and verse 19. Matthew 6, and verse 19. But then the question comes up, then how do you survive, right? People have wives, they have children, they have homes, they have whatever. And, uh, you know, it's not... Uh, any more righteous in Yahweh's eyes to be poor than to be rich. It's just that riches are a snare. That's what the problem is. It's not riches itself, but it's the love of the riches that become a snare. But how do we do it? How can we be a good servant and a good steward to Yahweh with the responsibilities we have in this world? And this is why he puts Matthew 6 here in verse 19. Do not treasure up for you treasures on the earth, where moth and rust cause to corrupt, and where thieves dig through and steal. But treasure up for you treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust cause to corrupt, and where thieves do not dig through and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also, right? So that's the point. When you wake up, are you so excited? Like I said, pinch myself. I'm, I'm alive. It's another day. Wow, where's my Bible? Oh, I can't wait. Let me sit down and read the word of Yahweh. Let me see. Father, what are you going to tell me today? What are you going to speak to me? Or is it getting up? And like I said, maybe you do read your couple chapters a day as a chore, but boom, that's over. Let me get to something else. Let me get to something else. So where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is your treasure this book? This is the greatest treasure in the world. And to think about it, there's nothing else like the Bible. I did that four-part series on the Word of Yahweh, which is awesome. If you haven't heard it, please listen to it. But there's nothing like this if you really think about it. What's the oldest, beside the Bible, what is the oldest writings on record, right? I mean, there are some records of things that were written 2,000 years ago, and, through, and there's even some hieroglyphics, you know, but they're small things, you know? They're, they're like a, a page or something of a hieroglyphic of a king from 3,000 years ago or a civilization. They're great. They teach us things about how people live, but there is nothing like the Bible, there is nothing like the Bible. There is nothing that actually go back and tells us of creation, how the world was created. And that's the problem with the, with the paradigm of, of evolution, that they simply just don't believe what's been written there and told about creation. If you believe creation, you have no problem with it. There is no paradigm. But if not, you know, if you don't want to accept that Yahweh's there, and the only reason they don't want to accept it, I said this many times, is because they don't want to be accountable to it. But where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be also, right? So you can't kid yourself and you certainly can't kid Yahweh. Are you a faithful steward? Are you being faithful? Is that where your heart is with, to the work of Yahweh? Or is it to worldly things? The lamp of the body is the eye, then if the eye is pure, all the body is light. But if your eye is evil, all your body is dark. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And it can be, the eye could be lustful, uh, in a perverted way, in a sexual way, it could be lustful in a covetous way. You know, everything you see and want to, be, to, to buy. It can be evil in a way of just seeing evil to everything. You know, just seeing that everything you see that somebody's doing is evil when it's not. You know? So, if the eye is evil, all the body is dark. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one is able to serve two masters, like I just said. For either he will hate the one and love the other, we will cleave to the one and despise the other. You're not able to serve Yahweh in wealth. And it's that simple. 
You know, where is your heart? Because of this, I say to you, do not be anxious for your soul, what you eat and what you drink, nor for your body, what you put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing, right? So here we are, we're entering into a time now where it's starting with travel, that travel will be limited and work will be limited to people that don't want to take uh, the vaccine and then eventually the nano tattoo and the mark of the beast, which come with it, right? Uh, but, you know, it's going to go to eating because once you can't work, once you can't buy and sell, once you can't get medical uh, assistance without taking that, that injection, what are you going to do? And if people today will take the injection just, just to be able to travel somewhere, one place to another, you really think they're not going to take it later when it comes to the fact of eating, of not being able to eat, of not being able to get medical help? No way. No way. So this is really a, this is a light test now where it's starting with immunity passports because later it's going to be a big test because then it's, 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 it's whether you could survive. But you know what? Yahweh is saying, look at this. Not to worry about that, right? Observe the birds of the heaven, that they do not sow, nor do they reap, nor do they gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Do you not rather excel than them? But who of you being anxious is able to add one cubit to a stature, right? Being worried about this and being all nervous about it, it's not going to make you any taller and it ain't going to make you live one, one more second of your life. It's trusting in Yahweh. It's just another test. And like I said, you look, the birds in the field, right, and, uh, and all the animals, they're not out there in society. They don't have to work. They don't need immunity passport or anything else. They don't need the mark of the beast. And yet they find food and the Father takes care of them. And actually, you know what it is? It's the fact that most of the world has been so abducted into commercial Babylon is what fears us. Because like I said, go to a, a, you know, if you go to most first world nations, particularly in Babylon, and you ask people, where does food come from? Their answer is the refrigerator. That's where they say food comes from. Because people don't know anymore. Just a hundred years ago, not everyone was a farmer, although there were a lot more farmers, but everyone farmed. Everyone grew things in their home, right? Everyone knew how to do it. Today it's not. Today it's people don't know anything about it. They don't know the first thing about it. So this is why people are anxious, because they don't know. Yahweh's saying, look, look at all the trees out there. Look at naturally, everything is society, you know, that uh, everything is right there for you to just pick, you know. And we've been blessed throughout the years that almost every place we've lived, there have been all of the harvests, grains, and, you know, uh, wild barley and wheat and oats and uh, almonds and lemons and pomegranates and dates and nuts and I mean everything just out there in the open just go pick it and eat it so Yahweh can take care of his people and that's where I talked about it before the, the kibbutzes the communities come in too because now as a community and we work collectively Yahweh can bless our efforts collectively and we believe it that's why we're preparing We've been preparing now since 2014, and we're preparing more. And this year, we're going to prepare probably more than all those six years before this combined. Because we believe in Yahweh. We believe in His Word. We believe what the Word says, and, and we want to be faithful stewards. He says, and why are you anxious about clothing? Right? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, how they do not labor or spin. But I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed as one of these, you know, not Solomon or, or, or his, the sanctuary, the temple, as magnificent as, as it was, it wasn't clothed like that. If Yahweh so enrobes the grass of the field, which is today, and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow, will he not much rather you, little faiths, do, do not be anxious, saying, what will he eat, or what may we drink, or what may clothe us? For all these things, the nation seek, the Gentiles, the non-believers, right? For your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. Do you believe that? He knows it. Of course he knows it. He created you. He knows that you need these things. And like I said, praise, praise Yahweh in one way for the covetous spirit of, of Babylon, not just in America, but all over the world. Because wherever you go, you know, we haven't lived in Babylon for 20-something years, but everywhere we live, there's always a second-hand store somewhere, you know. So, boy, this, that's a great market, you know, $1, $2. Sometimes at flea markets, they're 50 cents and a quarter. You can get a shirt that could be a $50 or $60 shirt, skirt, pants, whatever it might be, jacket, you know. I've gotten sports jackets, you know, for $2 in a secondhand store. So, he knows that. And you're not just finding that stuff by random. 
It's not that you're going in there and randomly finding this stuff. You know what? Yahweh is putting it there. He's putting in whatever you need. And I know through the years that anything I needed, I just prayed to Yahweh and he put it somewhere. It would be sometimes near, near uh, dumpsters. We'd find suitcases. We'd find all kinds of good stuff. You know, other times it would be a secondhand store. Other times it would, someone might just give it to us. There's people, sometimes we know them. There's people we didn't even know. And they come up and just said, I felt inspired by G.O.D. to give you this. They might not know him or his name, but he certainly knew them and inspired them. So he, he'll take care of it. But do you believe? If you don't believe, you're not going to get nothing. You know, like it says in Jacob, if you doubt, you'll get nothing. Because you know what you're doing? You're doubting Yahweh's existence. And you're doubting if he does exist, that he can perform what he said he's going to perform. And why would he do anything if you're even doubting that he's even there or can do it? But seek ye first the kingdom of Yahweh. This is the key now, right? Are you a faithful steward? Seek ye first the kingdom of Yahweh and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So it's not actually your responsibility to worry about what you will eat and what you will drink and what will clothe you. It's Yahweh's responsibility, and he'll figure out a way. You know, he'll figure out a way to do it. I say this all the time before I left Babylon. I worked my whole life since I was uh, seven years old, eight years old, when my first paper out. Always took care of myself, uh, never took any kind of salary from ministry or nothing like that, and uh, it was fine, you know. But after we left Babylon, and I was praying, I clearly heard a voice, and Yahweh said, work for me. And I went full-time working for him, you know, and he's provided. He's provided one way or another, sometimes through the blessing of, of inspired people that he's blessing, and like I said, other times, just out in the nature of finding things in the nature, and it's amazing. But Yahweh will, if you believe it, he will take care of you. But you got to believe it. you got to believe it. You've, and you have to, the way you show it, faith without uh, deeds is dead. The way you show your belief is by seeking first the kingdom. Because if you're seeking first yourself and the kingdom second, you're showing Yahweh you don't believe. That's where you're showing. Seek ye first the kingdom of Yahweh and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Then do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious of itself. Sufficient to each day is its own trouble. And I think of Richard Werbrandt when he said that about suffering and pain and being beaten. He said, you can't worry about tomorrow's beating because it hasn't come yet. And he said, for all you know, it may never come. The person that was going to beat you may be dead. You know, you may be freed or you may be dead. Who knows? But you can only worry about that beating you're taking at the time. You only have to take it a minute at a time and an hour at a time. You don't have to take it past there. And it's the same thing here, like he says. Don't worry about tomorrow. You know, if you've got clothes on your back and food on the table and a roof over your head, why are you worried about tomorrow? You might not even, you might be dead, you know. Or the kingdom may even be here. You have no idea. Worrying about tomorrow isn't going to change anything. And I've said this my whole life. It's a philosophy that I live by. I don't live in the past because you know what? I can never get it back. Whether it was good or bad or indifferent, I can never get the past back. It's gone. It's just a memory, and hopefully a good memory. But even if it's a good one, it's gone. And you know what? The future isn't here yet. So I can't worry about the future because it hasn't even come. But you know what I need to do? I need to live in the now because if I don't live in the now and focus on the now, I'm going to lose what's right before me. I'm going to lose all the blessings right before me. I'm not going to be able to. Because whatever my past is, if I'm focusing on the now, this now will be tomorrow's past. Right? Today's now is tomorrow's. It will be the past of, of, of tomorrow. So if I focus on the now, tomorrow will be a good memory. But if I'm not, and I'm only worrying about the future that hasn't come yet, then today is going to wind up being a bad memory tomorrow. And the future never comes because it's always one day ahead. So I can prepare for the future, right? Because if I prepare for the future now, then when the future comes, the now is going to be a good spot. And if I focus on the now now, then tomorrow the memory will be a good spot. But like I said, you'll never get back tomorrow and the future isn't here yet. So this is why we say, for tomorrow will be anxious of itself, sufficient to each day is its own trouble. That's what you got to focus on, what is right before you that day. Prepare, right? Prepare for it, but you don't have to worry about it. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. He says, but without faith it is impossible to please Yahweh, 
For it is right for the one drawing near to Yahweh should believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Like I said, this is where the rubber hits the road. You could say all you want. In Israel over years, I've met hundreds and hundreds of people that love the Lord and love the Lord and all of this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's what is your deed? It's what you're doing, right? And if you don't show faith in Yahweh, if you're worried about tomorrow and you're worried what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and you're worried about this, the, the uh, mark of the beast and all this other stuff, then you're not showing faith in him. It's that simple. Is he bigger than that? You know, is Yahweh bigger than that? Hasn't Yahweh been around forever? Didn't Yahweh create all these things? Didn't he create every human being? Didn't he create every tree? Didn't he create, you know, every plant? Didn't he create everything? And if he did, and he tells us he will take care of us if we are faithful stewards and looking about his work, seek ye first the kingdom, and he'll take care of the rest of it, then all we have to do is believe that. That's it. Just believe it. Believe it with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and everything else falls into place. Just believe it. There's nothing to worry about. And if you are worrying about, then you don't have faith. And it's impossible to please him without faith. Why? Because of course, if you don't even believe he exists, if you don't even believe that he's, 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 he's uh, righteous enough to reward you when you do good as he says, then why should he? Why should he? We can't doubt. Never doubt your belief in faith. Never doubt. We're Yahweh's ambassadors, and if we doubt, what we're doing is we're, we're doubting his ability to care for us, which is unending. And like I said, if he cares for every bird and every plant and every animal, then certainly he cares for you who are one out of the 10 million people that he's called into this world. Now, here we are, like I said, the curse that came from the first Adam and the thorns and thistles like we saw in Genesis 3, really... Uh, in the first covenant, there was very little fruit born for the kingdom of Yahweh, like we said, because of that. But yet, that curse in Genesis now has been lifted through the Messiah. Let's go to Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13 says, Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, having become a curse for us. For it has been written, Curses everyone having been hung on a tree. Right? What is that curse? That's the curse of Adam. That's the curse of the thorns and thistles. So that curse is now lifted. So now we don't have to work in sorrow. We can work in gladness, right? Uh, like it says that one sowing the seeds in sorrow and, and, and reaps in joy, bringing in the sheaves, right? And now we're at the reaping time. Now we're at the reaping time. And we should be reaping in happiness as we're bringing in the sheaves if we're doing the work of Yahweh. Because the curse, cur curse is lifted. So we don't have to bear fruit and thorns and thistles, but we can bear a hundredfold, and that's what he said. We can literally bear it a hundredfold. And we know Isaiah 65, when the kingdom comes, look at how beautiful, look at these prophecies of Yahweh's kingdom, what we have to look forward to. You can't focus on this wicked world of Satan now, because this is the kingdom of the devil, the kingdom of the enemy, but this is the kingdom we need to focus on. Isaiah 65, 16 through 19, it says, He who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the Elohim of truth. And he who swears in the earth shall swear by the Elohim of truth. Because the former distresses are forgotten, and because they are hidden from my eyes, right? The former things are gone. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former things shall not be recalled, and they shall not go up on the heart. However, be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create in Jerusalem a rejoicing in her people a joy. Right? The new Jerusalem. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem in joy in my people. And the voice of weeping and the voice of crying shall no longer be heard in her. Wow. That's what we have to look forward to. That's our future. That's our future. That's what Yahweh's doing. That's what he's coming. Verse 22. They shall not build in another live in them. They shall not plant in another eat. Right? For as the days of the trees are the days of my people, and my elect shall grow old to the work of their hands, they shall not labor in vain, in vain, nor bring forth for terror. For they are the seed of the beloved of Yahweh, and their offspring with them. And it will be before they call, I will answer. And while they're speaking, I will hear. Isn't that great? That I mean, because you know why? Because seek ye first the kingdom. And if you're praying about the kingdom, and you're praying about Yahweh's will, and you're praying about his work, He's hearing before you call because that's his will. You're already in his will. And he's hearing it before here and he's blessing 
before him. Isaiah 2 and verse 2. And it shall be in the last days the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Right? It will be in, in, over the whole earth. And many people shall go and say, Come and let us go to the mount of Yahweh, to Mount Zion, to the house of the Elohim of Jacob. And he will teach from his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Mount Zion the Torah will go forth and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And he will judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, right? Nation will not lift up a sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. And if you're watching the news, there's a lot of war drumbeats talking about, particularly with China, you know. There's a lot of war drumbeats out there. And uh, it's going to come. We know it. The Bible says it. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. But the war that comes with China will be a really, really devastating war and another sign that we're getting closer to the end. So uh, here is a time, though, when Yeshua returns back to this earth that there'll be no more war. There'll be no more war. There'll be no more suffering. And like I said, he will reign from Mount Zion and his kingdom and his word will go all throughout the earth. And this is, you know what? The world doesn't know this. People don't know it. And, you know, I... I, I love when people write into the website, but I'll tell you what I love the most when people write in. When people are writing in, a lot of them are writing in from China and Asia, and they're brand new. You know, they must have been atheists before because most of them were. And some of them, the questions are, you know, is, is Elohim really exist? You know, did Yeshua really die for my sins? You know, things that are simple to us, but to people that never heard it before. And I love it because... This is what it's about. Being a good steward over the work of Yahweh means that we are bringing this good news message to the world. And that's our commission from Matthew 28. Go into all the world and bring this message. In, in, in Matthew 24, when this good news goes throughout all the world, then the end will come. And we have probably what's the closest Bible in English to the truth that's been here ever. You know, the truth is the truth. And it was in Aramaic and in Hebrew, but, but most people don't speak that. So it's got to be translated into English and other languages, but praise Yahweh, he's allowed us to have what's probably the closest translation that's been. Matthew 24 and verse 27 says, For as the lightning comes forth from the east and shines to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 31. And he will send his cherubs with a great sound of a large trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from the four winds, from the ends of the sky to the other. Right? This is what our hope is. We have to be faithful. We have to be good stewards. We have to bring this message. And there's a lot to do. And let me tell you something. Every gift that Yahweh's given me for administration, I am going to use to the best of my ability this year. You know, we have about now a year and a half to the Shemitah. And we have to. We have to get all our work done. We have to be bringing as best as we can as our little group. Yahweh's working through others as well. But we have to worry about what he's doing through us. And we need to be doing that. And then after that, Yahweh the Father will come to the earth during the millennium and restore everything after the millennium. I'm sorry. After the thousand years are up, Revelation 21, Yahweh the Father himself will be dwelling on this earth. And this is what we have to look forward to. This is the reality. And I saw chapter 21 of Revelation. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and the sea no longer is. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Elohim, having been prepared as a bride, having been adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Yahweh is with men, and he will tabernacle with them, and they will be his people, and Yahweh himself will be with them as their Elohim. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no longer, nor mourning, nor wailing, nor will there be any pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And the one sitting on the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said to me, Write, because these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Aleph and the top, the beginning and the ending, to the one thirsting. I will freely give of the fountain of the water of life. The one overcoming will inherit all things. And I will be Elohim to him, and he will be the son to me. But to the cowardly and the unbelieving, right? This is what keeps people from being a faithful steward, the spirit of fear. To the cowardly and the unbelieving, remember it's impossible to please Yahweh without faith. 
And those having become sinful, and to murderers and fornicators and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Well, we don't want to be that. We don't want to be cowardly and unbelieving. You know, we just want to, with all our heart, because it's not about our work. It's not about what we're doing. It's about what our belief is what Yahweh's doing. And it's that belief that will convict us to have deeds. The deeds will come from your faith. The deeds will come from your conviction. It's that simple. Luke 19 and verse 12. Luke 19 and verse 12. And this is the great good news message. This is the message we should be bringing to all people and all the earth in which we are trying to do. And this is what we will be rewarded by. How well we brought this message. How well individually we brought it and how well collectively that we brought it. Luke 19 and verse 12. He said, a certain well-born man went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and to return, talking about Yeshua. And calling ten of his slaves, he gave to them ten minutes and said to them, trade and keep busy until it come. These are all us as disciples. But the citizens of his city hated him, talking about the uh, Jews, and sent ambassadors after him. And they were saying, we do not want this man to rule over us. And it happened as he returned, having received the kingdom, he even said, for those servants to be called to him, those to whom he gave the silver, that he might know what each had gained by training. So the silver is like the Rock HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit that he's giving us, and the gifts of the Spirit that each of us have. We all have different ones. So the first came saying, Master, your minner has gained ten minners, right? He, he, he bore fruit, you know. His faith was shown by his deeds. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you were faithful in a least thing, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your minutes gained five minutes. And he said to this one also, you'll be over five cities, right? And another came, saying, Master, behold your minute I have stored up in a face cloth. For I feared you, because you are a harsh man, taking up what you did not lay down, and reaping what you did not sow. But he said to him, I will judge you out of your own mouth, wicked slave, right? This is the one self-justifying himself, the self-righteous. You know, that it was Yahweh's fault, it was this one's fault, it was that one's fault, but it wasn't their fault. You knew that I'm a harsh man, taking what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow. And why did you not give my silver on the bank table? In coming, I might exact it with interest. And to those standing by, he said, Take the minute from him and give it to him who has ten minutes. And they said, Master, he has ten minutes. For I say to you that everyone who has, everyone who, who has of the Holy Spirit, that is receiving from the Holy Spirit, has gifts of the Holy Spirit, and is using those gifts as a faithful steward and bearing fruit, Everyone who has it will be given, they'll get more. And to from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken from him, right? Because the more you use the gifts of Yahweh, the more you, you grow in the nine fruits of the Spirit, the more you're going to grow in all the gifts. But the less you use them, and the little that you use them, the little you have will die. You'll quench the Spirit of Yahweh. So we're called now for a purpose, but not for ourselves. We're called to be part of something bigger. And that's why I always say, to be part of Yeshua's congregation, you have to realize that there's something bigger than you. For the person out there that doesn't want to be part of anything, who wants to just be, be of his own, and I've seen this for years in Israel, you know, even when things will be found, you know, like uh, whether it's the Tabernacle of David or Sodom and Gomorrah or other things that are found, and people, they don't want to come and come with the group and they don't want to see these things as, as the body of Messiah, they want to come on their own, they want to try to, because they might have some mammon, right, because that's where their treasure is, and they'll pay, try to pay a guide a $1,000, a guy that usually you could get for a couple of hundred, they'll pay him a 1000 just to take them there that they can see it themselves. And you know what? What good is it? What good is it to take home sulfur balls and see God, Sodom and Gomorrah? You, is that what you're looking for? You want to be part of Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> good luck. But to be part of something bigger than yourself, to be part of Yeshua's body, his congregation, to be part of something bigger than yourself, to surrender yourself to the plan of Yahweh, that's what's being a faithful steward. But if you're out on your own, just getting mammon by your own, and you can, there's a lot of people that can earn a lot of money in the world we're living in, because you know what? If Remember what Satan said to Yeshua? 
when he was tempting him in Matthew 4, he said, if you bow down to me, you see all these kingdoms of the world, I'll give you all of them because, because he had the authority over them. And yeah, you can make a ton of money. You know, I could go out, I can make a million dollars if I want to bow down to Satan in his society, right? All of these things out there. There's a million ways you can make money today if you want to compromise with the word of Yahweh. But that's not what we're called for. We're, we're, we already have a, 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 a vocation. We already have a job. We're stewards for the kingdom of Yahweh. And are you a faithful steward? Are you being a faithful steward? You know, are you surrendering your will to the will of Yahweh? Matthew 10 and verse 34. Matthew 10 and verse 34. He says, do not think I came to bring calm on the earth. I did not come to bring calm, but a sword, <laughs> right? Is the way of Yahweh, when you're living in a world where Satan is the G-O-D of it, and all these people are following him, when you're living in a time where all the people are going to worship the beast in, his, in the image of the beast, do you really think that, that the word of Yahweh is going to bring peace to the world? No. It's going to call out the, the very, very few elect that Yahweh is calling, but to the rest of the world, it's not going to bring calm. It's going to bring a sword. Do not think I bring... I came to bring calm on the earth. I did not come to bring calm on the sword. I came to divide a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a bride against her mother-in-law. And the adversaries of a man will be those of his own house, right? Wow, we see this a lot today. Because, you know, the more you follow Yahweh, the more people are going to turn on you, even your own relatives. The one loving father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And the one loving son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his staff and follow after me is not worthy of me, right? What is your step? What is what is that that in your life that, that you have to change, that you have to take up, right? The personal responsibility that you need to do. Whoever does not take up the staff and follow after me is not worthy of me. The one finding his life will lose it, and the one losing his life on account of me will find it. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also, right? So what is it? What is it, you know? Like I always say, the fact that I love Yahweh more, it doesn't mean I love my family less. But my family that are unconverted, you know, I'm limited with, with how much I'm going to surrender for them. That's not my first vocation. That's not my vocation, right? There's a time for everything. Like I said, I don't love my family less because I love Yahweh more. But now is the time for the work of Yah. You have to get your priorities straight. You have to get your priorities straight. Putting Yahweh first is not forsaking your family. And it's Satan that wants to bring guilt to this, right? There are responsibilities we have at time with our families, right? But then at other times, uh, we feel guilty. We're doing things because we feel guilty. It's not even our responsibility. And Matthew 8 and verse 20, very interesting scripture that I think I've only understood it in the last year or so, really, when you think about this. Because here it is. There's a rabbi that's coming to him, Matthew, starting in verse 19 in Matthew 8. And one scribe coming near, it's a scribe, says to him to Yeshua, Rabboni, I will follow you wherever you will go, right? And Yeshua said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the heaven have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So, yeah, when you follow Yeshua, when you're going to walk as a true disciple and you're going to be a faithful steward, it doesn't. You, you, there's going to be times you might not have a place to sleep. There might be times you don't have food. There, you're not going to have a lot of riches. You know, that's not what it's about. And that's what he said. Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no way to lay his head. You really want to follow me? <laughs> and then look at this. Another disciple said to him, Master, allow me first to go away and bury my father. Now, it wasn't that the father died and he was going to the funeral. What it was was that the father was older and he's saying, first let me go and be with my older father until he dies. It could be a year, it could be five years, who knows? And look what Yeshua says. Yeshua says to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their dead. Yeshua said, follow me and leave the dead to bury their dead. And I can tell you something. In the last year, uh, it's been very tough. I've had six relatives die in the last year. I haven't been there once for one funeral. And I think about the scripture every time because it's not the time. It's not the time for me to be traveling back to Babylon every time a relative dies. I can't do it. You know, <laughs> you know there are responsibilities sometimes, 
you know, particularly if it's a parent, they have responsibility. But we really have to think about this, you know. Yeshua said this, let the dead bury their dead, and we're living in that time. Our relatives are not following the way of Yahweh, and some will die, and some will die of COVID. And you know what? You know when they're dying of this? Brethren aren't dying of COVID because brethren are believing in Yahweh and following in faith. And these people are not. Our relatives are not following in faith. You know, so it doesn't mean we love them less. But what it means is we love Yahweh more. And as faithful stewards, we have to put our priorities now as time is moving on. And, you know, Satan, like I said, he'll use guilt, he'll use different things. And you really, really have to pray about it. Because, like I said, you know, everybody's responsibility is different. But Yeshua said it right here, let the dead bury their dead. And as we're moving on, and you're talking about immunity passports, mark of the beast, and all this other stuff. You know, there's a point where uh, you can't let your focus get away from the work of Yahweh. It's that simple. Matthew 25 and verse 31. Matthew 25 and verse 31. Because how are we serving in the body of Messiah, right? I mean, we look in the body of Messiah, most of our brethren are third world brethren, and over there, not only don't we have any COVID deaths, the work is, 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 is magnifying. You can't believe how fast things are growing. Every week, I hear of more congregations that are joining us, and not just people, sometimes it's people, you know, and every precious soul matters, right? But a lot of times it's full congregations, even with the pastor that are coming. And it's coming from all over the place. It's coming from all over Africa. It's coming from all over Asia. Sometimes it's Central and South America. You know, it's coming from, from, from everywhere that we, we look that these things are coming. So Matthew 25 and verse 31. He says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy cherubs with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. And he will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, right? So whether you're a faithful steward to Yahweh or a faithful steward in the world to Babylon, this is whether you're a sheep or a goat. And I gave that great sermon years ago on sheep and goats. Listen to it again. <laughs> and indeed, he will set the sheep off his right hand, but the goats off to the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, the blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I hungered, and you gave me food to eat. I thirsted, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, right? Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me, right? We have a prison ministry with, with hundreds and hundreds, probably more than a thousand prisoners in the last decade that have written in, asking for Bibles, asking. Full congregation sometimes in prisons. But also, you know, when, when we say we have brethren over here in this country that have no food or brethren that need help, are we helping? Are we helping or are we just saying, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you, but we're not giving anything. Then the righteous will answer saying, Master, when did we see you hungry and fed you or thirsty and gave you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and came to you, right? Because to these people, it was so much a part of their life, they didn't even know they were doing it. It wasn't like I always give the example when I lived uh, in Babylon before we left more than 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, we say, oh, we're going out this Sunday. We're going to go over here to Philadelphia, you know, looking for poor people and homeless and help them. And then, oh, the next time you go, you know, somebody would say, the next time you go, let me know I want to go. And it's like, you don't need me, man. <laughs> you can go out any day of your life. You can walk out your front door. You could pray to Yahweh and somebody out there needs help. You know, it's not something you just do for alms for people to see. These are people that were living it every day of their life. They just automatically helped whoever was in need. And the king said to them, Truly I say to you, in so far as you did this to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Right? So as we help the least of the brethren, we're helping Yeshua because he's in each and every one of us. Then he will say to those on the left, Go away from me, cursed ones, into everlasting fire that's been prepared for the devil and his cherubs. For I hungered and you did not give me a thing to eat. I thirsted and you did not give me a thing to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. And they will answer saying, Master, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer and say, Truly I say to you, in so far as you did not do this to the least of these, the least, neither did you do it to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Wow. So, 
Yeshua will, re will reward us, good or bad. We have to take our calling seriously. We're gonna get. We're gonna get what we deserve. You know, we're gonna get what our work is. Either way, good or bad, and we have to take our sin with our calling serious. Must be in our heart. We have to have zeal. We have to have zeal. We have to be so much in love with Yahweh and Yeshua and the work we're doing. It's got to be on our heart. That should be everything we're thinking of. All of our goals, our aspirations, you know, should be, hey, you know what? I want to make an orphanage. I want to make a, a, you know, a homeless shelter. I want to make a, 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 you know, a soup kitchen, whatever it may be. I want to make a printing press. I want to open a printing press so I can print Bibles all over the world, whatever it should be, but it should be something that's focused on the kingdom, like Matthew 6, 33 says, seek ye first the kingdom, and all these other things will be given to you. Like I said, it's not righteous to Yahweh, like in the, the medieval ages, where they had chains on their back, you know, and, 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 and like somehow that suffering to Yahweh is more righteous. And Jesus says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. But what he does desire is that we look after others, that we're good stewards, right? We're stewards over his work, and we're stewards over the earth. And then we're looking at this, we're, we're caring for it. Sometimes in the littlest way, like, uh, you know, uh, making sure that plastics aren't destroying the earth everywhere. And little things like that, and sometimes it's a big way of feeding the hungry and feeding the poor. And bringing Bibles to those in need. John 4 and verse 34. Yeshua said to them, my food is that I should do the will of him who sent me, and that I may finish his work. Is that what you say? Are you hungry for physical food or spiritual food? Is your food to do the will of him who sent you and finish his work? Do not say that after four months comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and see the fields. They are white and ripened for the harvest already. And while are the fields ripened now? After a year of COVID, after all these things going around, the fields are ripe and white for the harvest. And he that reaps, right? He that reaps receives a wage and gathers fruit unto life that is eternal. And the sower and the reaper together will rejoice. Like I said, we all have different jobs. Some are sowing, some are reaping, but we rejoice together because it's all for the same purpose. For in this the word is true, that another is the one sowing and another is the one reaping. I sent you to reap what you have not labored over. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor, right? The apostles, they sat down. They were the original sowers. And we're reaping some of the things that they sowed from years ago. Or even the Amish, you know, and the Anabaptists. So praise Yahweh for that. The harvest is ready. Are we as a collective body working in unity for the kingdom of Yahweh? That's what it's about. And I praise Yahweh. I thank him every day for the congregation of Yahweh Jerusalem. Like I said, we're just one tiny little speck in the universe, one little part of Yahweh's congregation. But I am so honored to be the leader of this little branch where people are working in community and they're working together and they love each other and they pray for each other and they'll help each other. And, and all of us can feed off of that. We feed off of each other and we feed off each other's testimonies and how what a blessing that is. Let's go to Luke 16 as we start uh, winding down here. Luke 16, because now we're going to see an example of somebody who wasn't a faithful steward. And you can learn examples from good and examples from the bad, as we see in Scripture, right, of both. Good kings like King David and bad kings like King Saul. But let's look now at Luke 16. And he also said to his disciples, a certain man was rich, and he had a steward, right? And this one was accused to him as squandering his wealth, right? And what is the wealth of Yahweh? The wealth of Yahweh is his work, his kingdom. And his master called him and said to him, What is this that I hear concerning you? Give to me an account of your stewardship. For you are not able any long to be a steward to me. And the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking away the stewardship from me, right? What if Yahweh did that to us? I am not able to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, that, I, that when I am removed from the stewardship, they will receive me into their houses. And having called to him each one of the debtors of his master, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred baths of oil. And he said to him, Take your statement and quickly write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? And he said, A hundred bushels of wheat. And he said to him, Take your statement 
and write down 80, right? Isn't this what the world does? When I read this, I think of the politicians today, right? The politicians, when we look, like we said, Revelation 18, where the rich merchants of the earth from Merck and Pfizer and all of these pharmaceutical companies, these pharmakia, and what do they do? They give millions and millions of dollars to the politicians. And you know what happens to these politicians? The ones that work for the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, they work there in the government for that, and they make all of the laws, not to help the people, they make the laws to fit Pfizer and Merck and all the pharmaceuticals, and then when they leave the government, they get a million dollar job with Pfizer or Merck or the other ones, you know, in management, even though they know nothing about it, you know. So this is the way it works in Satan's system, right? That you don't have to be righteous, it doesn't matter who you hurt, as long as you help the one who's, who's, who's scratching your palm, right, and giving you money, they're going to help you. And the master, this is the, the, the master of this unrighteous servant, applauded the unrighteous steward because he acted prudently, right? And people think this was a good thing. No, this isn't a good thing. He's, he's applauding this guy for being shrewd like him. This is the way the world is, right? And the world looks at that. Just like in politics, somebody will lie and somebody will cheat to get elected. And they'll bring out a false ad. And even after the guy loses, the one who lost, he'll kind of applaud him and say, wow, that was pretty shrewd of him to think up that fake ad that he did on me. But it's all evil in Yahweh's eyes. It's all unrighteous in Yahweh's eyes. For the sons of this age, right, the ones of Satan, the ones of the world, are more prudent than the sons of light themselves in their generation. Because the, the, the ones, and this is why I say, why it bothers me when people of the world take advantage of Yahweh's people. It, it, it burns in me because the people of Yahweh overall are naive because they, they, they won't do something back. Because we have the Holy Spirit, we don't fight back and we're not spiteful. And we don't try to hurt anybody and we forgive people that even hurt us, right? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But then they'll take more advantage of you because of this. Because the sons of this age are more prudent than the sons of light themselves and their generation. And also I say to you, if you make for yourself, now listen to what Yeshua says. And also I say to you, if you make for yourself friends from their wealth of injustice, if you're part of this system, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You're part of this system, this unrighteous system of politicians, which is everywhere on earth, and I've seen it firsthand in the government in Israel, you know, that if you're part of this system, when it is consumed, and it will be consumed, right, all governments, including the government in Israel today, will be consumed. They will receive you into their everlasting habitations with his lot the lake of fire. So this is a warning. This isn't saying, hey, that's a good thing you did, that this guy did, cheating his boss so that he'd be taken care of when he leaves. No. I say to you, if you make yourself friends from their wealth of injustice, when it is consumed, right, when Babylon falls, when it's all gone, when Yeshua returns, they will receive you into their everlasting habitations, into the lake of fire. He that is faithful in the least is also faithful in much. And the unrighteous in the least is unrighteous in much. Then if you were faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will entrust to you the true one? And while wow, over the years, I hate to have to say this, but there's been times where pastors have stolen tithe money and lied to the people. They're not with us anymore. <laughs> Is that's one thing we're not going to put up with. But people have done that. Someone who, who talk about an unfaithful steward, somebody that Yahweh has put as a pastor of a congregation, and they would actually lie, lie not only to me, and not only lie to the people, but lie to Yahweh for a few measly bucks, for, for, for a few measly pieces of green paper with dead dignitaries on it, that you're going to sell your soul, you're going to sell your salvation away for that. He who is faithful in little is faithful in much, and he who is unrighteous in the least is unrighteous in much. Then if you're not faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who's going to entrust you the truth? So, when we compromise with the world, we're no different than the unrighteous steward. So it doesn't have to be just money. When we're compromising in the world, whether it's compromising with taking the wrong job, living in the wrong area that you know you shouldn't live in because it's, it's, it's all evil and unrighteous. Uh, you know, whatever it could be, whatever it could be, the internet, social media, all these kind of things. 
When we compromise with the world, we're no different than the unrighteous steward. When you work in an unrighteous job, you like the unright you're just like the unrighteous steward. Over the years, I've been asked probably at least four or five times over, over the, the last 20 years, somebody that's like worked a job and they're asking me uh, if they should do it. Take for instance, like somebody who's working in a restaurant as a cook, and they said, I have to, you know, I'm, I'm obliged to uh, cook pork for the people there. Is it, is it something that's wrong? <laughs> it's like, is it something that's wrong? What is the word of Yahweh saying? That the pork is, 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 is not made for consumption. So even though if you're not eating it, why would you give it to someone else? Why is pork bad? Because it's an unhealthy food. It was never meant to be eaten. So if you wouldn't eat it, why would you cook it for somebody else, right? And then let's say you're there as the cook in that, in that restaurant and you're serving people pork for the next 10 years, then somebody that works there just winds up getting converted. And they're gonna wonder, how on earth did so-and-so, how is he cooking all this unclean food? You're not even supposed to touch it anyway. How is he cooking all this unclean food? So he was unfaithful in little is unfaithful in much. And we want to make sure we're not doing something that we want to do. Right? You wouldn't cook pork and give it to somebody else if you wouldn't eat it, right? There's been many times, whether um, with people or uh, even when sometimes I've been to uh, asked to speak at a congregation that may not be Torah observant and they're having a lunch and I'll say something right off the bat. I'll say, uh, I just want to let you know, you know, I don't eat pork or shellfish. And they'll say, oh, well, is it, is it for religious reasons? <laughs> they always ask that. Even at times when I've just been with, with even just uh, people that has nothing to do with religion. If I say something, if I'm at somebody's house and I say, uh, you know, I don't eat pork. Those, is it for religious reasons or health reasons? They're not, they, they're not asking that for nothing. They're asking that because people watch. People watch what you're doing and they know why you're doing something. You know? And we have to watch what we're doing. Because if not, he was faithful and little is faithful. He was faithful and little is faithful and much. And he was unfaithful and little is unfaithful and much. And we have to make sure, because people are watching, that we're being faithful in the little things. We don't want to allow Satan to be able to turn and twist people uh, and try to use us and try to say we're hypocrites when we're not. And social media and the internet is very difficult because many times things are twisted. And, pe and, and times people try to dig up your past of things that happened 30 years ago and there's nothing you can do about that. That's evil in Yahweh's eyes. People that have repented of things and, and they've changed and somebody's going to try to look up from something you did in high school 30 years ago or 40 years ago. It's just absolutely evil. But I'm talking about something you're doing today. What are we doing today? Are we a faithful steward? And we have to make sure that we are being faithful in the little things because people are watching. People look at what we do and why we do it. We can't have any compromise in our life. A job is not just a job, but it is your character on display as an ambassador of Yahweh. A job is not just a job, but it's your character on display. And one time, years and years ago, when we first left Babylon... Uh, it was the first year we were out. We were only out for, you know, a few months, and then we had to come back through Babylon on our way uh, overseas. We were living in Central America, and we left there. And uh, we were out of money, so we had to work for a few months before we were getting out, and we worked uh, doing inventory. You know, simple little job, right? You do inventory. You're a number. I was number 14276. I wasn't a prisoner, but that was my number with this company, right? And uh, there's thousands of us, and we go into like uh, a Walmart, and we're gonna count every screw, and, and I mean it's 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 a tedious job, you know. And I remember the boss Ben Solomon, you know, Ben Solomon was the boss, and real real straight guy, always with a suit and tie on, uh, never more than a hello. I never even knew he knew my name, but we were doing a Walmart. I think it was in Staten Island somewhere, and uh, he called me and my wife out out of, you know, like I said, there's like a thousand people that he calls them. We're wondering, did we do something wrong? And he came up to me and he said, the boss of this store said that there were two workers, a husband and wife team, that were working so hard and so diligent, he wanted to know if I would allow them to work for him permanently. And he said, you know something? He said, as soon as he said that, I knew he was talking about you and your wife. And I was like, well, I'll, I never knew, even knew you knew my name or you knew who I was, you know, but he knew it. 
he knew it. And that really, really stuck with me that this guy who has thousands of people over him and all I'm there is counting screws, that he saw me. And you know what? We, we volunteered to drive people. They would ask, you know, if, if you would drive people to the spot you had to go, they would actually pay you per mile, like 30 cents a mile, whatever. But I wasn't doing it for that. I was doing it because you can't talk religion on the job. You know, and you're working for them. You have to respect the rules that are there. And plus, you're working so hard anyway, you don't have time. But I did have time when I would pick people up and tell them what we were doing. I did have time when I was driving them home. And we witnessed to a lot of people during that short time that we were there. So it's important, like I said, a job is not just a job, but it's a character on display as an ambassador to Yahweh. Go to verse 12 there. If you were not faithful in that of another, who will give to you that which is your own, right? If you're not faithful in that of another, who will give you that which is your own? In something like tithing, it's so simple, right? You don't have to give 90% of your money. You don't have to give a million dollars. You give 10%. So if you only make $10, it's only $1 you have to give. Yahweh is so fair. But if you don't give that dollar, you're stealing from Yahweh. And how can you ever expect him to bless you if you're stealing your tithe? No servant is able to serve two masters. Here we go again. He will either hate the one and love the other or cling to the one, despise the other. You're not, you are unable to serve Yahweh and wealth. It's that simple. No money in the world is worth losing your integrity. No amount of money in the world is worth losing your integrity. The character of Yahweh that we are building, right? That's what it's about. Don't let Satan tempt you with these things. Matthew 22, the last scripture in verse 11. Matthew 22 and verse 11. And the king coming in to look over those reclining, he saw a man there not having been dressed in a wedding garment, right? And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here not having a wedding garment? But he was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Binding his hand and feet, take him away and throw him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Right? He did not have a wedding garment. What is the wedding garment? The wedding garment is that it's our character. Our character, we're clothed with righteousness. Right? We have clothed with righteousness. And every time we're building love, faith, joy, patience, Goodness, mercy, right? All these fruits of Yahweh's spirit. These are buttons on our clothing of righteousness. Robes of righteousness. It's a song that we sing, right? Our garment is the character that we're building. And this person had no character, right? He came in without garments on. And it's interesting because, you know, the physical comes before the spiritual. And I always say that, you know, that's why as an ambassador of Yahweh, we have to dress good. We have to look the part. You know, because we are his ambassadors on this earth. And we want to make sure. But our garment is the character we're building. We're made in the image of Elohim. We are growing in his likeness and his character. Every decision we make in life either gives us another small piece of the wedding garment, another little button on our attire, or it takes one away. You ever have a really nice suit or something, and all of a sudden you look down and a button is gone? And it's like, it's not just a, a simple button, it's a special button. And you're like, ah, oh, where am I going to find something to replace that now, right? Because it changes the whole thing. One little button, you know, one little, one, uh, little, little thing on, on a really, really nice piece of clothing can change the whole thing from it. So like I said, every time we're building character, we're getting another little button on that, that clothing righteousness. And every time we do something the opposite way, we're losing that. Every act of righteousness, every denial of sin is another button on that garment that we're growing into. As, as he did with Adam, Yahweh has entrusted us to plant and to grow a spiritual garden and to be stewards for the kingdom of Yahweh. We are joining a 2,000-year-old body that has worked on this since Yeshua, the second Adam, redeemed what the first Adam lost, right? That's what the parable of the sower is all about. We have a great responsibility in this work to be faithful and to bear fruit. So we must follow Yeshua's judicial order and reject our corrupted human nature daily. It's a mindset. You have to live in this mindset daily. Yahweh has entrusted his kingdom work to us. He could have used others, right? I say it all the time. I'm not the most qualified person to be in my job. But I'll tell you one thing. I'll be the hardest worker. <laughs> I may not be the most qualified, but I will be the hardest worker. I will fight tooth and nail because I am honored that Yahweh has called me. I'm honored to be in the position I'm in. And I, wanna, I wanted him to say, you know, 
Come into the kingdom, good and faithful servant. So we must follow Yahweh's judicial order, reject or corrupt the human nature. Yahweh's entrusted his kingdom work to us. He could have used others, or even had cherubs do this, as we see in Revelation. A lot of cherubs will be doing, but he chose us. Because he is preparing us as his children to rule with him in his kingdom forever, right? So we are, we are being trained now in the family business, and that's what it's all about. And that's why Yahweh isn't using cherubs or others. He's using us because he wants us to train and he wants us to learn. And he's preparing us as his children to rule with him in his kingdom forever. So, are you being a faithful steward to what has been entrusted to you? Are you being a faithful steward to what is being entrusted to you? Yahweh bless. Shabbat shalom.